And for a year and a half in Chicago, we're going through fertility treatment, you know, and just struggling and just another point of frustration and contention within our marriage. You know, I'm just feeling like we're failing as parents. We can't have another child. And so right. we're at this church function and someone from the church sits down with you and they ask you to pray with them. And we prayed for a child. And then we went to church the following Sunday and we just felt fulfilled and we felt just right and at home. And the following week we had a positive pregnancy test oh. and it just, there's no words for it. We tried science for two years. We tried everything logically for two years. And the first time we dropped to our knees and asked God for something, he gave it to us. And, and that's how Lana came to be. This is the Fit Investor Podcast, where we talk about how to live a more holistic life of being fit, not only financially, but physically and faithfully. We'll be joined by experts in all these areas to share their experiences and actionable and practical tips so that you can be a fit investor too. So now let's join our hosts, Kale Delaney, Wesley Whitehead, and Brenna Carls. All right. Welcome to another episode of the Fit Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Kale. Here with my co-host, Mr. Wesley Whitehead. John. And today we have another special guest, Mr. Ryan Duffy. So Ryan is doing a bunch of stuff. He is real estate broker, home builder, property manager. He specializes in short-term rental investments near Branson, Missouri. So Ryan used to be a Chicago firefighter where he suffered from some back injuries during his career, which we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. Uh, then he and his wife decided to give up the city life, pursue some star-filled skies and lake life, inquire a country. And so they moved out to the Ozark Mountains, and that's where they set up their Duffy Homes Realty, where he assists clients in the sale and acquisition of investment properties. He also has his construction business, Duffy Homes LLC, and he has some cool stuff going on there, which we want to talk about some of his current projects. So the Duffies pride themselves on supporting others in their investment journey, emphasize the transformational nature of smart real estate investment for individual families and communities as a whole. So Ryan, why don't you expound a little bit on that? Because you got, you got a lot going on, man. Yeah. First of all, thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. So yeah, I mean, we, we came down here almost seven years ago now from Chicago, and it was really on a lark. We, there was no planning involved whatsoever. We, this has been the spot that we came down to for 4th of July for 10 years. And we're at a position in our lives where I was looking at either spending the rest of my career behind a desk with the fire department or doing a complete change. And that was 4th of July, 2016. We're down here and we just, I just had my first surgery. I was looking at probably six months of layup time. We just sold our house in the city. We were renting an apartment. Our son was three going on four at the time. And we're down here 4th of July and we just didn't want to go home. We're you know, just thinking about our, we had no green space. We had the alley that, they, that our kid played in and that was about it. And uh, so we got about halfway home and we stopped outside of St. Louis for the night and pulled up Zillow and found the worst looking listing you can possibly find. The photos were awful. It was like a flip phone camera close up of the front door. But, but I'm looking at this thing and it's a three bedroom house on an acre and a half. It's two minutes from the lake. It's 20 minutes from Branson and the property taxes were 400 bucks a year. And it was 120 grand. <laughs> and I look at Shay, I'm like, this, this spot looks awesome. This is right near where we've been vacationing for the last 10 years. It's so cheap. Cost of living is so low. I can deliver pizzas and pay this mortgage if I had to. That was literally the conversation, right? The next morning we drove back, looked at the house, put an offer in, and we were down here 60 days later and just completely uprooted everything and, and had to reinvent ourselves and, and start new careers. And so it was a process. Fast forward, it didn't happen overnight, but I, I got into construction. Shea got into real estate and then our paths remerged two or three years later. And, uh, and I got my real estate license. I started working with her. And, uh, and we've gone on to, to create our own brokerage. I put the construction business on the back burner as real estate was really rock and rolling from 2019 to 2022. And then when we actually started the brokerage last year, it was right around the time that the market was starting to correct. And there was a lot of concern of real estate. It's going to keep trucking along the way it's going. So I'm going to reactivate the construction business and just have, have another source of income, just diversify a little bit in case we had to. And, and it's really worked out well. <clears throat> we're not going and building dozens of homes. But what we're doing is we're creating a very niche marketplace for initially it's going to be short-term rental properties, like unique custom short-term rental properties. But ultimately we want to get into affordable housing, 
veteran housing, the sorts of things that have been really unattainable over the last two or three years in this real estate environment. If you had a FHA loan or a VA loan, you're taking a back seat. It's everyone's paying cash over asking. And the people that really needed support the most were being underserved. So we'd really like to be able to, to find a way to get into that, that, uh, that demographic and serve that aspect of the community um, in this kind of growing marketplace. So it's not just vacation rentals. Wow. So that, a lot of cool stuff that I want to touch on there. So first off, if you're comfortable sharing, you know, what, how old were you when you made this like whole uprooting of your life? 31, 32, 31. something like that. Okay. Yeah. So the reason I wanted to ask is because when I made my transition into this whole entrepreneurial and real estate thing, yeah, I was 30, 35, 36, which again, these ages are still relatively young, but talking to people in their twenties or whatever, it sounds like we're ancient, right? I wanted to highlight that because <clears throat> frankly, it's never too early, but it's also never too late to be able to make a transition. And you made a huge transition. Not only did you change the career, you changed the location, you started these businesses. That's a huge 180 from the life you were living and what you were doing. Was there like a, I know you talked about, it was just, you really loved being in that area and it seemed like a better spot to, to raise the kids, but was there like any particular like pain point that really pushed you over the edge to say, all right, enough's enough. I got to make this change. It's time. Yeah. I grew up in the city. You know, obviously I worked there for a long time and that's really all I knew for the majority of my life. And I, I don't think I realized until we started spending more time out in the country just how much stress there was living in that environment and just a number of aspects. And we can get into, I don't want to get, start getting into politics and, and all the other social aspects of it. But it just, the more I looked around and the more I was working in that environment and the older my son got, the less I wanted to raise him in that environment. And we'd come down here and just the mentality and the attitudes that people had were just so much different. You're not, it's hard to quantify, but like it's sitting at a red light in Chicago. As soon as the light turns green, if you're not gunning it, there's someone laying on their horn behind you. You know what I mean? Out here, it's just a different pace of life. And people stop to talk to each other. People wave at each other when they're driving down the road. Really, it's, it's hard to quantify, but it's just a different environment. So the more, the more I was looking down at the prospect of not being able to do the career that I'd grown to love, the actual firefighting, the hands-on, getting in there with the guys and doing search and rescue and doing all that fun stuff that you see on TV, the more I realized I couldn't do that anymore the less there was holding me in that environment. I'm looking around, I'm like, I'm working in two jobs. I've got a house, but I'm barely making ends meet because the taxes are through the roof. Everything else is getting nickel and dimed on me. And on right. top of that, that, you know, I'm hearing gunshots at the park across the street from my house where I bring my kid every day. It's just not, it, more and more, it just I started expounding and growing on our, our, on our thought process and just thought, I just don't want to be here anymore. It was, it was a kind of a slow progression over the course of a year or so. But right. at the end of it, like, we we're just, we we're just done. I had no interest in, trying to ride it out and preserve my pension or anything else like that. I'm just like, I just want to go, I just want a clean break. And how old were your kids at the time? We just had Gavin. So he was three going on four. Okay. So he was just turned four after we moved here, down here. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, I completely understand that. I live in South Florida, which is not quite as urban as Chicago. A lot of the similar aspects in the suburban type lifestyle, whereas I grew up in very small towns up in New England and my family still lives up there. And I remember when I first moved down to Florida, it took me a good six months just to remember to lock doors because you, know, you don't do that. You don't even up north. We didn't own a key to the house. You leave the car keys in the car. That's just my father does that to this day. The keys are in the car. He has a neighbor that sometimes he needs to borrow my dad's pickup. So he'll go out in the morning and see his pickup gone and say, oh, I guess the neighbor must have needed it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's one of, the, one of the weirdest things when you move to an environment like that or away from it. I remember about two weeks after we moved down here. I was at the gas station, I was filling up my car and a guy started walking over towards me from another <laughs> pump. And my first instinct was, I don't have a dollar, I don't have a cigarette. <laughs> okay. And he just, he reached his hand out and he said, Hey, I'm Bill. I've seen you around here. Are you new to the area? I'm like, yes. I, nice to meet you. I'm Ryan. He's like, all right, see you around. And he walked away and I was blown away. I'm like, that's the strangest interaction I've ever had in my life was just a <laughs> genuine person coming to say hello. Right. So that's really personifies like this, the difference in attitude. You know, unfortunately, really like, when you tightly pack sinful human beings in a small space, yep. the worst aspects of our personality come out. And then mm -hmm. when you spread us out and give us room to breathe, we become much nicer people. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's like when God says spread out and multiply and fill the earth, as opposed to hang out and babble. It's almost right. like he was saying. He almost did what he was doing. Yeah. It's a very good, a very good point.
yeah. you think about it, kind of going along with that is right. on the urban or suburban settings. Yeah. You're, you're in these communities, houses right next to each other. Yet it typically makes you more isolated because mm. oftentimes you don't even talk to your neighbors. Frankly, I don't know every neighbor on my street, my community, but yeah, when you're in the country or whatever, your neighbors, so that's, I never really thought about that, but that's, you're that's appreciative interesting... of them because you're spaced mm. out the importance of community. Yeah. So you want to get to know them. Whereas in the city or someplace close, you're like, get off my lawn. Don't leave. Thanks. Right. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're messing up my grass. But it's just, it's like a logistics thing too in the city. There's so many people in such a tight area where if you stop and say hello to everybody, you wouldn't get anything done all day. You know what I mean? So I think there's an aspect of that too, where you need to put on blinders and almost desensitize yourself to, to the, to your community so that you can move on with your day, which is just completely yeah. unnatural. That's sad. Yeah. All right. So you moved to the Ozarks and you started to get into the real estate. Did you have a background in real estate prior to that or not at all? Kind of what, what, spurred, so um, what, was, yeah, what spurred that? So we, the first house that Shane and I bought when we got together shortly after I got in the fire department, it was our starter house, borrowed a few thousand dollars from my parents to put a down payment on FHA loan. And at the time we're thinking we're doing the whole 30 year plan. I'm going to do my 29 years in a day, pension out. We're going to raise our kids in this house. We're never going anywhere else. And so that was the mentality while we lived in this house for two and a half, almost three years. So did a lot of sweat equity to it. We bought it after the crash. So we had a lot of appreciation mm -hmm. on it pretty quickly. And, uh, and we reached a point where, you know, my, I was more or less debilitated. Like I couldn't get around. I was before my first surgery leading up to that. It was years of pain medication and trying to mitigate it. And at the end, it was just brutal. I was hooked on painkillers. I could barely work my main job. I couldn't work my part-time job floundering in debt, sh we're sh working through Shay's college education and that, that wasn't cheap too. So we reached a point where we realized that we have to sell the house. And we looked and we saw how much equity we had in it. And we had seen like $120,000 appreciation in equity in the three years that we lived in it. So we're like, oh, that's awesome. So we'll sell the house. We'll pay off our debt. We'll ha still have a nest egg. We'll get an apartment. And that was the first year we went and got our taxes done professionally because we're freaking out. Like, this is a lot of money. Like, we're going to have to pay a bunch of taxes and this and that. And that was like the first aha moment. We're sitting down with a CPA and he's like, no, this was your primary residence for the last two, two of the last five years. You don't want to pay a dime on that up to, I forget what the limit is, 240, 250. And we're like, you can just do this? Like, every two years, live in a house and flip it and then just pocket that money? And he's like, yeah, that's what a lot of people do. We're like, Wow. Okay. And then, so that was like the first taste of it. This wasn't just a place to live in. This was like the best piggy bank we've ever had in our lives. <laughs> so that was kind of the first taste. And so when we're still living in Chicago, she had got her degree in interior design. And, and then she started working part-time with a real estate agent there as a real estate assistant. And so she was starting to see that aspect of it too. And then we fast forward, when we moved here. We just didn't feel there was, there was quite the market for interior design in the Branson area, which we were completely wrong, but that's just the interpretation we had at the time. So she just, she got a real estate license right away and, and, you know, slowly throughout the years, when we, when we first moved here, we didn't know anybody and real estate is all about who, you know, and making connections and being established in the community. So it really took a while for that to take hold. But, uh, but ultimately after about three years of doing real estate here, as I'm building my construction business, Shay is starting to work more with investors doing short-term rental properties. Mm -hmm. And so she started coming home talking about P and L's and booking reports and all the stuff that I had no idea of that neither of us had any inclination that was an industry. And, and throughout this time, we're reaching a point now where we just had our second kid and we're starting to outgrow this house that we were living in, talking about having a third kid. And we're like, we need to build an addition or build a garage or this or that. And at the same time we're having this conversation, we're telling ourselves like, this is a great house to vacation in. It's just not comfortable to raise kids. It's three levels, but the kids' rooms are on the second floor. Our room was in the basement, changing diapers in the middle of the night. We're running up two flights of stairs and which is brutal. But we kept telling ourselves this over and over again. This would be a great place to vacation in, rough to live in. And then she comes home one night and she's like, bet you if we put this place on Airbnb, we'll make 30 grand a year. I was like, there's no way. Like, you're out of your mind. We're in Omaha, Arkansas. No one's ever heard of this place. She's like, yeah, but we're 20 minutes outside of Branson. We're right next to the lake and there's no vacation rental restrictions where we're at. If you go five minutes up the road across the Missouri border, you can't do, you can't do that. They restricted this back in 2018. So she talked us into buying a metal shop building up the road from where we were living and uh, with, with my partner at the time who I was doing the construction business with. And because our business had grown on that side too, and we were running out of space for equipment, material and stuff. So there was this metal shop building that came for sale and it had a two bedroom apartment built into half of it. The other half was just open shop space. So I said, Hey, let's buy this through the business. Shay and I will rent back the apartment from the business 
and we'll, uh, we'll turn our place into a short-term rental and we'll see how it does. And three months after we went live on Airbnb, I was done taking construction jobs and I was in real estate school because it just blew away our expectations. This little three bedroom house that we were hoping to do 30 grand a year in ultimately ended up doing 80. Wow. So within literally within three months, it had replaced my income by the time I factored in expenses and fuel and all the stuff that goes with it. Being a general contractor in a smaller, a smaller operation, you're not making a whole lot of money by right. the time you factor in your expenses. So it very quickly reached a point where, you know, that just entirely surpassed my income. And, and so then I'm just managing the property at the time I'm cleaning the property too, doing all the guest interaction and then doing my real estate classes at the same time. So then I guess to a degree house hacking, cause we bought that place as our primary, very little down, great rate at the time. And then, and then now we're renting a place, right? So now we don't have a primary again. So then the house next to where we're renting comes up for sale. We buy that as a primary residence and with the intention of moving into it and redoing it and everything, then COVID hit literally right in the middle of our closing. And so we had to shift gears and like, I don't know, the, all of our rentals at the first place just evaporated. There was 30 grand worth of revenue, just poof, gone into thin air. So then we're like, all right, maybe we'll just, we'll go ahead and close on this place. But we ran a bunch of pro formas. We're like, you know, as a short-term rental, if this thing shut down, it's not going to work. But if we just go in and vacuum the carpets, shampoo the carpets, repaint the walls, we could put a long-term renter in here and actually cash flow a little bit every month. So that was the new plan. We Went up, went closed in this place. We're like, you know what? Things are a little tight. We've got the rental property that's not making any money. We've got the shop building that we're renting out now, which maybe we should just stay in because we pay way less for that than we're paying for this new place. So we spent a month literally rubbing down walls, cleaning the carpet, getting ready to put a long-term renter in there. And then it was May 1st of 2020. It's like the floodgates opened. Everything started booking up again. So then we shifted gears again. We're like, maybe the short-term <laughs> rental thing will work. So we took that house that we just got done cleaning and we gutted it and we, we redid everything and, and made it into a really nice four bedroom, three bath rental. And, and it was off to the races. It's just, I haven't looked back since. Now we're getting more into new construction projects and doing custom builds and, and just all the crazy weird stuff that we can think of that nobody else is doing around here. So that's where we're at today. Wow. So you got into the real estate without really knowing much about it. What, what about the construction business? Did you have a construction background? Not at all. You... No, no. So, no. So how do you even do this? Like, how do you say, okay, now I'm going to, now I'm going to be a contractor as well. I have no yeah. idea what I'm doing. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a big part of it's just faith, to be honest with you. Cause we didn't, we didn't have a clue about any of the things we were doing when we first came down here. We didn't have a clue about the area. We didn't have a clue about any of this, but we just kept telling ourselves if we're committed to it and we believe we have faith that we can do this. We have faith in each other that we can make this work. So part of the plan when we first came down. Shay, we had some family here. Shay's got an uncle and an aunt that had a couple hundred acres near where we moved. And he was a general contractor in California for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So when he moved here, he semi-retired, but he was starting to develop some of his land and he wanted to sell off individual build lots. So at the time we moved here, he had somebody who wanted to buy an acre from him and have him build him a custom house. And he couldn't find anyone to help. So he offered me a job. It was like 15 bucks an hour, cash under the table to spend a year working with him. And we built this client a house from the ground up, just the two of us, literally everything. So just a complete crash course without, I'd done some, some minor framing. I did some remodel work on the house we had in Chicago, really just watching YouTube videos and trying to figure out what I was doing. Right. So then when I had this opportunity to apprentice under somebody that knew what they were doing and really completely hands-on for it ended up being about a year and a half. So we built, we built two houses from the ground up. And, uh, and then, and then I branched off and started a residential remodel business with my other partner that I met up with uh, a couple of years later. And it was really just hands-on. And initially when I would go out and bid jobs on the remodel side, if it was something new that I hadn't done before, I would, I'd walk through the house, I'd take a video on my phone, I'd take notes, I'd do measurements and I'd say, okay, I'll get back with you in a week or two and get you a bid. I'd go home and I'd be up all night on YouTube, like scrambling, like, <laughs> how do I do this? And then calling people, trying to find subcontractors. So really just working the problem. And if it's not something that, that I would have been comfortable doing, then I would source somebody else. And I'd say, okay, how much would you charge to do this? And then, okay, I can add a builder premium to that. So I'm just working that angle and, and just kind of learning as I go. Same thing with real estate. When I got into real estate, and I told people from the beginning, I don't, I'm not a residential realtor. I, I just moved here. I don't know the area. I don't know the schools. But having this hands-on experience with the short-term rental thing and being the guy that's scrubbing the toilets, being the guy that's taking the bookings, being the guy that's running the numbers and tracking the expenses, 
I can talk about that all day long. I don't need to know the area in terms of schools and playgrounds and stuff. Because all most of the people are buying here anyways, they're remote. Half the clients we deal with, we don't ever meet in person. I can go and look at a property and run a pro forma and say, okay, this I think this could do pretty well. Um, and here's why. Because it's just numbers at that point. It's numbers and right. and uh, and everything else that goes with the occupancy and the daily rate and everything else. So just again, and learning as we go. And, and trying to surround ourselves with like-minded people and people that are smarter than us, really. I'm trying to interact with people on Facebook that, you know, that, that have done this for years and that have the tips and tricks and can tell you how to optimize things. So that's really what it's been about is just learning and growing as we go. Yeah. So I think that's the golden nugget from this is okay. you put in, obviously, the time, the work. Like you said, you and your wife are the ones in, down there in the nitty gritty doing this, figuring it out as you go. and. I think so many people get stuck. You hear that the term analysis paralysis a lot in the investing world, but for a lot of things in life, get stuck because I don't know how to do that or ah, that's gonna, that sounds like a lot of work. But you put in the time, the effort, and you took, you said, I'm going to get my hands dirty and I'm going to put in this and get this done. And yeah, it took a little bit of time, right? It didn't just happen overnight. But now you've got all the stuff going on. You're successful by, by a number of measures. And so I think people need to understand and look at themselves when they come up with these excuses of why it might not be the right time to do this or why I can't do this. I don't have this skill or that skill or whatever, or I have kids, I have a family, I'm this age. All of these things can be overcome. If you truly want to make a change in your life in whatever area it may be, you can do it, you know, and that's what we try to promote on this podcast a lot is that anybody can be successful. There's really, you don't need to have special gifts or talents or come from money or any of this stuff. If you are willing to roll up your sleeves, put in the hard work and give it time with discipline, consistency, and time, success is almost automatic, right? It, there's really no secret formula beyond that. You just, you exemplify that and everything you've done, getting started in all these different businesses that you had no idea about uprooting your life from a long-term career, that firefighter, that's something that kids dream about becoming, right? And you just made this big change and it's worked out for you. So I think that's really encouraging and I hope our audience can see that and hear that and take some inspiration if you're in a, and if you're in a situation where you think that maybe you don't have what it takes to do something, look at Ryan, look what he's done. Thank you. No. Yeah. I want to just touch on before we transition off, because it's for my personal interest, I want to hear about these, this container home project that you got going on. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a goofy one. So part of the idea behind that is here in the Branson market, it's restricted and regulated. So most of the inventory we have is condo. Over the last two years, it's been these big lodge developments that are also condos. They're standalone condos. So We've just been disenfranchised with the inventory options. Like the, our personal rentals over the state line, Arkansas, they're more cabin in the woods, kind of one-off, unique, different. And so we really wanted to do something that, you know, that went along those lines that just completely broke the mold from anything else that you'd see in our marketplace. And it's right around the time that Airbnb did their change and they, they created the different categories. Category. And so I was paging through those categories. And I'm like, oh, cave. Yeah, that'd be cool. Or, or earth house. That'd be cool. Like, Container house. That's weird. I started seeing, seeing some people on Facebook and Instagram, like posting some ideas of doing shipping container houses and this and that. And really it, it started out as a, not really a joke, but just a, like a pet project. I paid a guy on Fiverr to come up with some renderings for me based on some inspiration images I saw. And then, and then I bounced them around with some contractors that I was working with, a welding crew that I was talking to. And yeah, we can do that. Oh, cool, cool. And, uh, and so really the whole, the whole idea behind it was to do something weird and different. So I was helping this, this landowner who were, were, we had his land listed and it was right around the end of last year when market started correcting and people, people were getting nervous on interest rates. So originally we were going to do five bedroom, like what everyone else around here is doing, like the lodge development. But the market just shifted and it wasn't really playing out for that. And but I had this, these container plans sitting on my desk and I'm like, man, it's really cool. I really want to try one of these. So I, I worked out a deal with the landowner and the owner financed the land from him on this quarter acre lot, a small lot, but the view was phenomenal on either side. And, uh, and then I, we had just got our next two rentals up and running, which are literally right across the street from the site. Got them up and running, got them cash flowing, pulled appraisals on them. Hey, whole bunch of equity in them. So now I've got a big line of credit that I could do something with. So I'm like, all right, so we're going to we're gonna do a little experiment here. We're going to do this goofy container build. We're going to use the line of credit 
that we've got. We're going to hope that we can get financing on it because I talked to banks for six months leading up to this. And every bank I talked to loved the idea. They loved the pro forma. <laughs> they loved the projections. And they said, build one or two, and then we'll talk about financing them right. because there's nothing to compare it to. There's not a single container home within, at least not a residential container build within 150 miles of us. And that's what it boiled down to. Banks were happy to lend on it if it could appraise, but there was no guarantee it could appraise. So we started building it with a line of credit. And, uh, and it's been a process. We've had to really R&D this thing as we go. So it was really difficult for me to factor in a number of expenses, like with welding and fabrication and the cost of steel. When I first started putting these plans together, steel right. was a lot cheaper than it was now. <laughs> and lumber was a lot higher. So at the time, it's, oh, yeah, this <laughs> makes sense. We're not building out of wood, so it'd be cheaper. Not so much. No, it's actually way more expensive than building out of lumber. But, uh, but it's been coming along really well. And just the, just the look of it and the uniqueness and the views that it has on either side, we got this thing about halfway done. We're projected to be done towards the end of next month with substantial construction. I actually just had spray foam come in today and get nice. ready to do sheetrock later in the week. But uh, once I got this thing trucking along a little bit and there was actually something to look at, I had people wanting to invest in it, which was really interesting. It's not a, not an angle that I even thought of before. My, my thought process was we'll try to sell this as a spec home. Or we'll, we'll get it done and pull a loan on it. But, but then when I realized no one will finance it, and then people started coming up and saying, hey, I would love to have a piece of that. Can I buy equity? So that's interesting. Let's talk about that. Let's see what that looks like. So that's, that's how we're actually finishing this thing out. We started with a line of credit, but now we've got two partners that wanted to jump on board and buy equity in it and then just have us manage it on the back end. Mm -hmm. So we'll still own a quarter of it, but then we'll also get to get management fees on top of it. Just again, thinking outside the box and trying to try, trying to figure out a way to solve a problem that's not, doesn't really have a conventional answer. If you believe in the product, if you believe in your work and you've got faith in your ability to get it done, there's always a way to, uh, to come up on, come out on top, make something happen if you really push through it. But we're excited about that one. I'm also excited that I couldn't get financing on it because <laughs> if I could, There'd be seven other container homes sitting right next to it. Getting back right. to the, the one-off uniqueness of it. The only other person that can do one of these is someone paying cash at the moment. So that, that kind of helps in terms of inventory and just standing out from the crowd. Yeah. And like you said, you didn't even get into it with the angle of having potential investors and partners. And but now it opens up a whole new business model for you now. Yeah, um, exactly. And uh, yeah, I just... I've been enamored with these container homes for years. I think I'd mentioned it. I'd seen the first one actually in my travels in Colombia and South America. And there was this whole container building office park where it was just these, yeah, these, I think they were like the 20 foot long Connex boxes stacked perpendicular to each other on top. And each one was its own like studio office studio. So one place was like a hairdresser. One place was like a pet play. It was just, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I was like, oh my gosh, this is brilliant. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have the wherewithal to actually pursue and doing something with it like you did, but that's why I just, I love it. I think it's such a cool idea and I think they look so neat and everything. So I'm interested in following along and in, in, in your journey with that and see how that all turns out. Yeah, it should be pretty cool. We found a manufacturer that does uh, custom shipping container pools also. Well, so yeah, we're, we're seeing those. So we're probably going to put a 20 foot container pool behind the container house just to really put the icing on the cake for the weirdness, you know? Now. I'm going to have to get that contact info from you after this because I have some ideas with that. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and transition into the next segment here. We're going to talk about the fitness part. So like we talked about before, you were a firefighter for a long time and it's not, you sustained these back injuries during as part of your career. Was that? Or yeah, more or less. Or? It, just, it progressed. So I'm, I was diagnosed with de degenerative disc disease years ago. So I can't really look back and identify a single instance where, you know, oh, my back went out. But there, right, there were a couple right. of fires I was at where I did something weird, felt something pop. And then, you know, but I was like 22 the first time I injured myself. So literally six months out of the academy, we're over, overhauling after a fire, cleaning up. And I had to do something weird. I had to straddle a hole on the floor of a kitchen and then grab a refrigerator and twist and push it out of a window. Cause there was, we were going through with the thermal imaging cameras and there was a hot spot behind the fridge and part of the floor had burnt out. So I was a new guy. So, Hey, <laughs> go ahead and do that. Uh, sure. Why not? So I did that and felt a pop, but I'm 22 years old. Adrenaline's going, I'm fresh out of the academy. Um, yeah, exactly. Nothing can hurt you when you're 22 right. years old. So I, I get done and we go back to the firehouse and we do 24 hour shifts. And it just so happened that I was going on furlough. I, was, I had vacation time coming up the next day. So when I woke up the next morning, I was on vacation. We got done with the fire. I'm feeling a little sore. 
And I'd run on the treadmill earlier in the day and did some, lifted some weights. And so I, I go to lay down. And I'm like, man, my leg is like killing me. I think I pulled a hamstring or something. Wake up the next day, I could barely walk. Like my leg hurts. My, my back was fine. But I had this shooting pain down my right leg. Yeah. Again, being 22 years old, not knowing anything about it, like, probably pulled a hamstring. So I didn't say anything to anybody. I go on furlough. Actually, it was the first time that I came down here to the Ozarks. And I was meeting my wife's extended family. And <laughs> it was, I mean, I... We got down here and after the eight hour drive, I literally couldn't walk. I hobbled into an urgent care here in, in Branson and I must've looked like just the picture perfect junkie. I hobbled in this place. I'm like, I hurt my leg before I came here on vacation. I just need something for the pain, please. <laughs> I'm on vacation. I'm meeting my, my, my wife's family and they're just like, no, here's some <laughs> ibuprofen and we'll take an x-ray and Okay. So it was just absolutely brutal. And then I got, I ended up getting back home and I got an MRI and, and they're like, yeah, you hurt. You've got two herniated discs, L4, L5, S1, and you're going to need surgery. And I'm like, I don't want surgery. I'm 22 years old. I, I And I've got other people in my family have had gen, degenerative disc disorder. And so I've seen what that looks like when you get multiple levels fused and you lose mobility, you've got long-term chronic pain. So I really fought that. I was telling myself, I, I could probably stand to lose a few pounds. I could start doing yoga. I can do all the things that, that can help mitigate this. I'm not going to get two levels of my back fused at 22 years old. Yeah. So that's what I did. So I went, I was laid up for probably three months on the, after that first injury, I ended up getting some epidural injections, started taking some prescription strength, <laughs> anti-inflammatories. I started doing yoga. I started getting more flexible yeah. and just really trying to work my core and emphasize just more of a healthy lifestyle, which helped initially, but it hobbled along for another year or two. I got to the point where, you know, that first epidural injection lasted about a year. Next one lasted about six months. Next one lasted about three months. So about two years after my first injury, I, I was at a point where anti-inflammatories weren't doing any. So I ended up taking, taking Norco on top of that, Vicodin, and, uh, and then started getting these epidural injections on a regular basis. Hmm. And, uh, and then fast forward another four or five years of doing this on a daily basis on, on opioids and taking these injections. And I remember walking into my pain management doctor's office one day and I'm like, doc, I'm really concerned about these opioids I'm on. I'm taking, at this point I'm taking seven or eight a day. You know, I'm popping two every three or four hours. Yes. And uh, he's like, yeah, that's no good. That's no good for your liver. We're gonna kick you up to Oxycontin. <laughs> like Oxys, like, isn't that like prescription grade heroin? Right. He's like, yeah, but it's fine. Just take it as prescribed, you'll be fine. You're the doctor, all right, cool. So that was the next six months of my life was literally at a point where I'm struggling to walk because I'm too, too, uh, too stubborn to go get surgery. Right. And so now I'm taking Oxycontin every day. And, uh, and throughout this, I, I did have kind of an end game. I've been doing a bunch of research. I knew I didn't want a fusion, but I, I've been seeing all these artificial discs that are being used in other parts of the world. And, uh, and I had a, what I thought at the time was a really good Blue Cross PPO plan. So I could shop around and talk to different specialists. And so I ended up spending about two or three years just floating around from specialist to specialist and saying, Hey, what do you think about these artificial discs? And 90% of them, they never heard of them. They're like, nah, it's, the technology is not there yet, this or that. But I identified the actual disc that I wanted and I've been reading case studies on it and people have been using these in Germany and Sweden five or six years with 90% success rate. And so I walk into this one neurosurgeon's office and I'm like, doc, what do you think about this active L lumbar disc? And at first he was talking about, oh, you need two levels fused, you need this and that. And I mentioned specifically this disc and he lights up like a Christmas tree. It's the best thing in the world. He's at, he's, I scrubbed in on the trials for that. I've done probably 10 or 12 of those. It's got the best success rate, the best long-term, you know, prognosis. I'm like, awesome. Can we do that? He said, no, the FDA has not approved it yet. Well, shoot. I'm like, but they're, they've been using it in Germany for six years. He's like, I know. I'm like, and this is right when we were getting ready to sell our house. I'm like, doc, I'm in a position where I can sell my house. I can have 140 grand in the bank and then go rent an apartment. If you were in my position, what would you do? He said, I would sell everything I've got. I would fly to Sweden or Germany and I would have this done out of pocket. And he gave me contacts. He gave me a doctor he scrubbed in with in Germany and Stockholm, Sweden. He's like, both of these guys are stellar. Go for it. It's be the best thing you ever did. So that was our plan. So we were going to sell the house. It was going to be and actually not too terrible considering the cost of healthcare in America. I think the price for us to fly to Sweden, to have two levels of my lumbar replaced with artificial discs and a week of recovery, it was going to be like $28,000. Oh, wow. And there was a potential that I could get Blue Cross to reimburse me. So I was like a no brainer. Let's go yeah. to Stockholm. Did some Zoom consultations with a surgeon, really liked what I heard, started forming a plan and we were going to go out there. I think it was the end of August of 2015. 
was the plan. And while I was waiting for that date, I was still doing my regular yoga and everything else. I was sitting in a hot yoga class, doing a stretch, and I just felt a pop, just a pop and a, just a lightning sharp pain down my right leg. And I'm just like, this isn't going to be good. So I get home and all over again, I can't walk, but worse than before, just terrible. And I'm popping Oxycontin like they're Tic Tacs and it's just not doing a thing for me. And I put up with that for about a week. And I just finally, it was Father's Day. I remember being at my parents' house with a cane and just struggling to just be present. And I just, I looked over at Shay, I'm just taking the nearest emergency room. I can't do it anymore. And so they take me in, they give me an MRI and L5S1 ruptured is what happened. And the liquid that's inside that disc is slightly acidic. So that liquid from the inside of the disc had been sitting on my sciatic nerve for that whole week and basically corroding it away. So they did what they call a microdiscectomy, laminectomy. They cleaned it up. They got the, they got the, the disc serviceable again. But then they said, all right, now you need to recover before you do anything else. So I talked to my surgeon in Sweden. He's like, you got to wait six months before you do this. You got to fully heal. So then while I was recovering from that surgery, the FDA approved the disc that I was going to fly over for. Nice. The catch was they only approved it for one level at a time. And I needed two. So I had to go in, get the first one replaced. I had L5S1 replaced. I had to recover for a year oh. and then go in through the exact same incision point and get L4, L5 done. So that was a process, but, but it was fantastic. I've been off the painkillers ever since. I don't even take ibuprofen anymore. It's the best thing I ever did at the time. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's all I Active, have to say on that. That's... Active L lumbar. If you're young and healthy and your doctor's telling you to go fuse your spine, go get five or six or seven other opinions because there's other options out there. And, yeah. and to that point too, you know, what I did trying to delay the inevitable, ultimately it worked out because I was able to get the procedure I wanted to have done. But throughout that time period, and I know like as far as a health issue goes nationally and probably worldwide, the whole opioid thing is insidious. It's terrible. Yeah. You shouldn't, you should not be on that stuff for more than a few days if you need it, because it just sneaks up on you. And when I remember waking up from my first surgery and I just, I felt fantastic. I'm like, I don't have any leg pain. I don't have any back pain. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done with the painkillers. I didn't feel right for a year afterwards. It was a struggle psychologically, emotionally, physically. It was very difficult to come off that stuff. And I wasn't, I wasn't taking it to get high. I wasn't taking it for fun. I was following doctor's orders for right. five or six years, but then coming off of it, you're on your own. Blue Cross right. is happy to cover <laughs> the cost of the Oxycontin, but if you go and try to detox and yeah. do a Suboxone treatment, you're on your own. That's cash out of your pocket. It's that state of things. Yeah. You know, so this is. I think this is really important in hearing that story there because literally that, that, that story could change somebody's life. If somebody hears that that's been considering a, a fusion surgery or something like that. And they didn't even know that there were these options out there because like you said, when you were talking to your doctors, they weren't giving you these options. And even when you no. brought it up, they turned it down. Right. And that's unfortunately not to get off into that whole rabbit hole. Cause trust me, I could go down that as well of the way the healthcare system is these days in Western medicine. But oftentimes the first, the first suggestion, if you want to say that is either, like you said, it's either a drug to alleviate the symptom, right? Not necessarily the cure, but mm -hmm. to alleviate the symptom or a surgery, right? That can have these debilitating effects for the rest of your life. And there are other options out there. I think that's important for people to hear. And I hope that maybe this does get out there and somebody does hear that's going through a similar situation and they can, they can learn from that. And again, this just goes along with the theme of what we were talking about earlier with you in terms of your business, but you, once again, you put in, you were the one doing all the research, putting in all this effort to solve your own challenges, solve your own problems that unfortunately the medical profession was not providing you with a reasonable or a good solution for. And thank God it sounds like you're physically in a much better position now that things have worked out with everything. So that's, it's a really great story. And Wes, you had a back surgery, didn't you? I did. I wish I knew about this back in the day. I had my surgery when I was 21 and uh, yeah, luckily I've been okay since, but uh, hearing what you're saying has, has a lot, it rings true with me in a lot of ways. And one thing I think about with you is the word comes to mind is persistence. You were very persistent, which I think has led to your success in all the different venues you've had, including your recovery is that you put your mind to something, you do the background, you do the research, you don't give up. You push through when you hear no, and that, that's inspiring. Thank you.
Yeah. You just have to do your own diligence. It's too easy to walk into a doctor's office and have them tell you to do something and say, okay, yeah. there's a doctor. But right. even even with with the procedure I had done, because there's different ways of doing that too. The easiest way for the doctors is to go in through your back and they cut through all that back muscle and then they <laughs> do, a, do either the fusion or the artificial disc. But then your recovery is a lot longer and there's more of a risk of, of long-term damage and, and just issues because they just cut through a bunch of back muscle. So the surgeon that I ultimately went with, the neurosurgeon I went with, he was really, really big on going in. Uh, it's been a while since I've even had a look at medical terms. Anterior, I believe. So through the front instead of posterior. When they do a back surgery through your abdomen, it's actually much better, it, it, it situationally, but it seems like overall much hmm. better for the patient for recovery, but it's less common. And this is what the surgeon told me. He says less common because it requires two surgeons to do that procedure. You need the neurosurgeon that's actually fixing the spine, and then you need a vascular surgeon who's basically just there to move everything over for the neurosurgeon. Mm. So getting back to the broken system that we have or the issues within our system, the hospital or Blue Cross or whoever is setting a fee for that right, procedure. Right. And if you're splitting that fee between two surgeons, they're making half the money than if they were to make, just do it on their own, go through your back. So that was another consideration that I had never even thought of that this neurosurgeon brought up. He's do not let someone go in through your back and do back surgery. It <laughs> sounds, seems like it makes sense, but it's really not good in the long run. Yeah. There's just all kinds of different, different aspects to not just medicine, but anything else, you know, always get a second or third opinion, uh, yeah. even with like building or real estate or whatever. Don't just mm -hmm. take one person's word for it, unless you've been working with them forever and you just really believe in what they tell you. But if you're getting a bid on a repair or something. If it seems unreasonable, get two or three more bids. There's no reason right. to just believe what you're being told. Even if the person that's telling you believes it themselves, they may right. be wrong and there might be a better way. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's some really good information there. And uh, I know I had, uh, I had sent you that information on that, that one book, which I, probably doesn't apply to your situation there, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's so many different aspects of ways or treatments that I guess you call them maybe holistic or whatever, just non-traditional types of therapies and things that can have astounding results. You hear these stories. And in fact, this morning on, when I was driving, I was listening to a, another podcast and I was talking about this guy overcame pancreatic cancer through some holistic treatments of just juicing, which mm -hmm. I've heard, you know, that a lot. And the success rates are, seem to be phenomenal with just strictly a juice fast or a juice diet versus going through chemo and all this stuff. And lo and behold, he overcame the pancreatic cancer when he was giving uh, like only a few months to live when he got the diagnosis. There's just so many things out there. You can take what a doctor says at face value. Obviously we're not doctors here. We're not giving you medical advice. All we're saying is research the other options because just because a surgery is recommended or a drug is recommended doesn't necessarily mean that is the proper thing or the only way to do it. My back issue was nowhere near as serious as yours. It was, it was just to the point over a period of time, I'd have these pains that would come and go. Sometimes they'd last sometimes for a month, sometimes they'd go away. And then eventually it came and it stayed and never went away. And I uh, got to the point where I couldn't stand up for more than 10, 15 minutes. Just the, the wasn't severe pain, but it was just this, this ache and discomfort that you just couldn't take it for very long. And uh, for me, I came across that. This book, Healing Back Pain, which talks about the mind-body connection and how stress can have these really negative physical effects on your body. And once I applied that mentality and things, it did go away overnight and it's been years and years and it hasn't come back. And uh, it was just the kind of thing where though I was going to doctors, I was getting CAT scans, like I even had this full body CAT scan done. They couldn't find it. multiple doctors, couldn't find anything wrong. I had one doctor even say, maybe you should just stop lifting weights. And for me, that's like a big part of my life. There's no rationale. It was just like, maybe, maybe you should just stop. It's like, why are you yeah. serious? But that's, that's the kind of medical advice that, that I was being given. And thankfully I found something alternate that, that worked out for me as well. So again, the golden nugget here is guys, do your research, put in the work and you can, don't have to just take what people say at face value here. So really inspirational story there, Ryan. Thank you for sharing that. Again, I hope, I'm sure that's going to ring home with a lot of people because back pain is so ever present in today's society for a lot of reasons. So hopefully some people can get some other options from hearing that. Why don't we jump into talking about your faith journey? We, Wes and myself in this podcast, we come from a Christian perspective and we try to highlight how that faith aspect intertwines with all these different areas of, of your life, your business, your physical fitness, all these things. 
So if you can just share with us your, the background on your spiritual journey, when did you learn about Christ? When did you become a Christian and where are you at now? Yeah. So I was, I was raised Catholic. I went to Catholic school briefly when I was really young. And then we moved, we moved when I was kindergarten, first grade, something like that. And then went to public school and fell off of it as a family. We just stopped going to church. I've always considered myself in the back of my mind, a Christian, but never really, never really practiced until, until we moved here, to be honest with you. So the whole time that Shay and I were together, and we've been together now for 15 years, you know, we never went to church together. We never prayed together. It just wasn't something that was ingrained in our lifestyle or our background. And uh, when we made the change and came, came here from Chicago, we came with a whole bunch of baggage. We, our relationship was strained. Our health and our mental states were, were not healthy. We'd gone through a lot. As a couple and individually, uh, we had a number of issues. Our marriage was on the rocks for years before we moved down here with, for a number of different reasons. And, uh, and so we moved here and started feeling this breath of fresh air and just started feeling the sense of community and started just, just realizing that we were missing something in our lives. And uh, it would probably been about, about two or three months after we moved down here. Again, we didn't know anybody hardly. Gavin was almost four years old. He would have just turned four. And, uh, and we saw a thing on Facebook for an open house at the, at, at the First Baptist Church in Branson. And they had a bouncy house and they had playground and this and that. We should, let's go here and let's let Gavin make some friends. Let's meet some people. And so we went to this open house at this church. And uh, didn't, don't want to say I had a closed mind, but I did at the time. I was very much of the mindset that organized religion was, was a scam or it was a human construct and whatever. I just had my own thought process and beliefs. So I went in with kind of a closed mind. But at the time, like I said, we were I was coming off the heels of my second back surgery. I still had another back surgery to go. We were having trouble with fertility. We'd been trying to have our second child for almost two years and mm -hmm. the whole, for a year and a half in Chicago. We're going through fertility treatment. We're doing all the things that, you know, and just struggling and just another point of frustration and contention within our marriage. You know, it's feeling like we're failing as parents. We can't have another child. Just the, the thought processes that go with that. And so right. we're at this church function and we wrap it up and, you know, they, they leave, you go through the back to exit and they have everyone separate off into small groups and, and someone from the church sit down with you and, and they get your information and they ask you to pray with them. And this was, I think, like literally the first time as a couple that we had ever prayed together. There were periods throughout my life before that where I'm in a really bad situation or desperate, and it's real easy to drop to your knees and pray when you're desperate for something. But Man. this is the first time where it's like we're purposely together sitting down, like, what should we pray about? And we prayed for a child. And then we went to church the following Sunday for the first time as a couple. And we just felt fulfilled and we felt just right and at home. And the following week we had a positive pregnancy test. No way. Wow. And it just, there's no words for it. We tried science for two years. We tried everything logically for two years. And the first time we dropped to our knees and asked God for something, he gave it to us. Amen. Wow. And, and that's how Lana came to be. Lana May Duffy. That's awesome. So, that baby was not meant to be born in Chicago. No, oh, she was not. <laughs> no. But that was really powerful for us. Um, um, and we're still, I'm not by any means a good Christian. I don't believe I am. I try to be. The only, there was only one perfect Christian. We're all waiting for him to come back. <laughs> but ever since that moment, it's just been, it's just been a paradigm shift in our beliefs. And Does the church know that prayer resulted in Lana's birth? Yeah, we brought it up to the to the member that prayed with us a couple of times. Great. That's a great encouragement for them and their faith. Yeah. No, it was amazing. Just, just really rocked us to our core. And we've tried, and again, we're not, by any means, we're not the best Christians in the world. We miss church probably more than we go. We try to give as much as we can, but we try to, we try to implement Christ and his teachings within our businesses as much as we can. We try to make a point of lifting up others around us. We try to make a point of giving back as much as we can. And, and really creating a supportive environment for the people that we choose to do business and life with to, to try to just raise everyone up and encourage everybody and just try to be good members of our community. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. Now that's, that's powerful testimony. And <clears throat> again, it's sharing these types of things that, that really provide encouragement and inspiration. Even when you were just telling, saying that to, to us here, feel that the hair stand up on you 
on your arms. That type of stuff is awesome testimony for sharing, for bringing glory to God. And yeah, trust me, we all have work to go or to do in our Christian faith and our Christian journeys. It's such a, it's such a hard thing to come to terms with. One, one thing that's been on my mind a lot lately, and it was, I, it was another podcast that's, I listen to a lot of podcasts, so that's where <laughs> a lot of things come from for me, but it really put this into my head that you, it's not about being perfect, right? And, and in fact, it's our faults and our struggles and our sufferings that make us more able to help other people because if we are perfect, right, we can't relate. We can't relate to other people's struggles and pain. If we do, if we go through, like in your instance, a fertility struggle that can have the, that can have a lot of mental and emotional stress and, and baggage that, that goes into that. I have a couple of friends of mine have been going through some fertility struggles and thank God they've actually overcome them as well. But during that period, I could just hear about all the pain that, that they go through in that whole struggle. But for you having that experience now, that's something that you can tap into and talk with other people about and share your testimony of how prayer enabled you to receive this wonderful miracle and that can inspire and encourage other people in their faith journey it's definitely easier said than done to not get discouraged and think that we're not worthy or we don't deserve this or all that stuff but the fact of the matter is god's given us just like he gives us blessings he gives us sufferings as well so that we can utilize those to help other people and you just think about jesus himself he suffered every temptation known to man so that he can console us as well in our pain and our suffering. If he didn't go through that and he was just the perfect God, then he can't relate. You know, I think there's a beautiful aspect to the sufferings that, that we go through. And I'm, I'm trying to get that into my head a lot more because there's some personal struggles that, that I'm going through that, that hold me back from a lot of things that I want to pursue because you just don't feel like you're worthy. If somebody only knew all this kind of behind the scenes stuff, why would they come to me type thing? But trying to think that, okay, how can I actually use those struggles to help other people? How does that enable me now instead of how does that hold me back? Yeah. And guys, piggybacking off of that, I, you made a comment before about, you know, I'm not a perfect Christian. I think that, 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 that defines Christianity. If you think you're exactly. perfect or you think you've got yeah. it all together, you're not a Christian. Let's just be real. Okay. <laughs> that Jesus had the most disdain for the self-righteous religious people. He had absolutely no tolerance for them. Even John the Baptist, when the, when the religious leaders came out, he's, who told you, you vipers, to come out here and, and be baptized? So I think that, that there is key. And then just to piggyback off of both of you, God does use the trials and tribulations of this life to not only shape us into who he wants us to be, but also to bring him glory. So sometimes we'll say, why is this bad thing happening to me? Or why can't I overcome this struggle? Yeah. Sometimes it's not about you at all. Maybe it's about someone else, someone else who eventually you'll meet that needs to be encouraged and you'll have gone through, have those battle scars to encourage them. Sometimes it's just so you can suffer in dignity around non-believers to bring Christ's glory. And you may say, why is that? Well, we, we don't know that reason. You can look in the Bible, many examples. You have Job. Why did Job suffer? There, there's never an answer given other than Job's sufferings have brought so much glory to God yeah. for millennia with his testimony of perseverance. So I would say, yeah, that's, that's be powerful. I love your testimony. Uh, I love the humility. That's what we need. And uh, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. I do. Yeah, no, that's really good. And uh, so do you, uh, is that same church that uh, you had this prayer and everything at, is that, do you still go to that church or? That's yeah, our home okay. church. Yeah. You know, when we do make it to the Sunday service, they actually started a, an elementary school through that oh. church. So we've got, all of our kids are going through their academy right now. Awesome. So. Good for you. Christian education. I like that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, especially growing up in the public school system, seeing and hearing about what they're talking about and what they're doing. They start teaching Latin in first mm. grade and really just, mm. uh, just all the aspects of a classical Christian education that I'd never heard of before. Oh, so it's classical too? Yeah, that's yeah, classical. That's our kids go to classical school. And like my sixth grader just completed her first research paper and thesis in sixth wow. grade. Isn't that crazy? And it's obviously not as well written as it would be if you were in college. Sure. But the fact she's doing it in sixth grade and she'll do it again in seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. And by, by her senior year, she is going to be, it'll be easier for her. 
And that's what 100% classical education really does push the limits and glorifies God in the meantime, which you can't beat them. Exactly. Yeah, that's something we're looking into with our kids as well. And there's actually a new program and a new bill that just got passed in Florida that is actually going to supposed to now provide some additional funding resources for everybody to be able to put kids into private schools, that type of thing. So we're going to be going through the application process and all that to let me know about that, Kale, because I'm in Florida too. I could use that. Oh, yeah, obviously. Yeah, it's called HB1. Okay. So just look up. Google HB1. Yeah, so I, not... I got four kids in classical school <laughs> this year. I'll have five kids next year. So it's good. I can use that. That adds up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely Google HB1. So it's the application process isn't open yet for the next school year, but it's supposed to be opening up pretty soon here. So you just got to keep tabs on it yeah, um, and submit. But yeah, it's supposed to be supposed to offer just additional funding for there's no income limits. There's no nothing. No, really. It's just a voucher basically to use towards any type of private education that you want. But is funding Florida. limited? I don't know. If it is, I got to get in there and beat you. This <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah, your five kids are going to tap out the system there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Excellent. Yeah. So well, this has been really great, Ryan. You shared some really excellent, really inspirational stories. And I think yeah, the one word that sums it up, Wes brought up there earlier is perseverance in all these different aspects of your life. You've shown a lot of grit and determination and we didn't really tie it all together yet, but you're, when you were talking about your back issues that you're going through and correct me if I'm wrong on the timelines, but I think it sounds like you're going through the back issues, you're going through the fertility issues and moving and changing your life career and starting all this up, all at the same time, pretty much. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just get yeah. it all done at once. I think Ryan should write a book about how he did all this so. he did actually i touched on it on the hospitable host a little bit yeah yeah so Not yeah so, so much you can say in a few hundred words but exactly yeah so ryan ryan is another author in the hospitable host two book that's bestseller out now on amazon so you can check that out and read a little bit more about his story as well on there but yeah so that, that's just obviously a big testament to you your character and to be able to work through all those struggles and, and still maintain a foundation of faith through it all and it's just another reminder, I think, for all of us that you never know what struggles people are going through behind the scenes. And just like the scripture says, we may, we may entertain angels unaware and we should adjust our behavior according to that. And I guess the link that I'm going to with that is when we meet somebody, we don't know what's going behind the scenes. They may seem like they've got all everything together on the surface when it may be treading water behind the site right? and they're just putting up a good front. And so we got to be conscious of that and try to not be as judgmental when we meet people, try to be more kind with other people and empathetic, maybe because somebody's you know, or something like that. You just don't know what's going on behind the scenes that can, or that's making them that way. So I think it's just a good reminder to be more empathetic with people in our interactions in daily life. Yeah. So this has been excellent. I guess we're just going to wrap it up here with a couple last questions. If you could give us three actionable tips that can be in any of these areas that we talked about or all three in one, three actionable tips that you would give to our audience, what would you think of? Good question. I would say pour more into your family and your faith than you think you've got time and resources to. It's real, really easy, especially being an entrepreneur, starting your own businesses, really trying to scrape everything together. It's real easy to let everything else fall by the wayside. It's easy to work 16 hour days. It's easy to come home and say, I'm too tired to, to read a book to your kid, or you're too tired to go for a walk or ride the bike or something like that. Just do it. Just do it. Pour into your family, pour into your, your marriage. That's probably the biggest mm -hmm. one is pour into your marriage. That was one of the, one of the biggest considerations of us starting our own businesses and going into business together was for, for years, we just were two ships passing in the night, had two completely separate lives. And uh, it, was, it was a strain on our marriage and our relationship. I would say pour into your family and your marriage and your faith and, uh, and everything else will just fall together in place. That's excellent. And yeah, we didn't even touch on that regrettably now, cause that, that would have been a great thing to, to talk about, but. Good advice. Yeah. Excellent. And what about, do you have, can you think of three, three books? that have had an impact on your life? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me this. I completely forgot about it. 
off the top of my head, I'm going to be, I'm going to be generic and say the Bible, which I haven't read enough of it yet. And uh, man, honestly, no, I don't do a lot of reading now that I no. think about it. No, there we go. That's fine. Fair enough. Yeah. And uh, Wes, you want to do the final questions? Yeah, sure. I'll just make this, make this quick here. What would you say to your 20 year old self? If you had the chance. Quit wasting money and buy real estate. There you go. <laughs> the right cars the don't matter. The clothes don't matter. None of the stuff I spent money on in my twenties mattered at all. I, like if I would have bought a condo or a house or something like that. I would have been so much better off. Excellent. So, yeah, that's just start that's investing. Quick. Right at the point. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's excellent. This has been great. Tell our audience, where can people find you, follow you, stalk you, get in touch yeah. with you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm on Facebook primarily. My name is Ryan Duffy. I own Duffy Homes Realty. Find us on Facebook at Duffy Homes Branson. We've got a website, DuffyHomesLC.com. And uh, you know, those are, that's our biggest web presence is Facebook and then our website. Our property management site is OzarkMountainVacation.com. We only have a couple of properties on there now, but we're getting ready to roll out several more. So the container house will be on there and then we're doing some other cool, unique builds that'll be on there shortly as well. Awesome. awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories. We hope there's a lot of inspiration that comes from that. And with that, I'm Kale. He's the bearded man. We're signing off. Thank you. Thanks, guys.